Thank you for joining us on The Skeptic Sidekick, where we delve into ancient societies, the ghosts, the paranormal, UFOs, all looking at it from the perspective of the true believer and from the skeptic perspective. Joining me, my partner, my co-host, my sibling, Kimber Rodriguez. Myself, I am Richard Gregg. And again, let's look into being the skeptic psychic. Hello, and thank you once again for coming to this wonderful group we like to call the skeptic psychic. I am just a co-host, my little insignificant, but with me is the wonderful, beautiful, highly intelligent, greatest person I've ever known, my sister, Kimber Rodriguez. Hello. So how are you this week? I'm doing fine. How are you doing this week? I'm doing okay. It's been a, it's been a week. That's understandable. It's been a week and a half with uh, two thirds of partial rain, but it, possibly with the heat going on and the uh, lonely secret location here in the beautiful state of Washington, it's our highest uh, last week was about 111. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. No. Is that after heat index or that's the actual temperature? That was the actual temperature. I believe that was on a Wednesday or a Thursday. That is insane. Um, it's been in the 90s here in South Texas. We have had the heat index has gone over 100, but the actual temperature itself has remained in the 90s. Anyway, uh, we thought it'd be pretty fair that we'd go ahead and do sort of a haunted city location, that sort of thing this week by looking at the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful town, which the locals like to call New Orleans, but everybody else is just New Orleans. So what do you think about this topic? Um, I'm actually pretty excited about it. I remember we went to New Orleans once when we were kids. Our parents took us to the World's Fair. And I don't remember much about the city itself, but I've always wanted to go back. I hear there's a lot of great history there, which I love history. A lot of spooky paranormal stuff. So I'd like to check all that out. In fact, I heard that there's a ghost tour it's a pub crawl slash ghost tour. And what they do is they take you to all these different bars throughout um, throughout the strip there in, well, not the strip, but throughout New Orleans. They take you on down to places around the French Quarter and uh, show you, you know, what possibly may be haunted and may not be. Yes, yeah, so you go into the bar, sit down, have your drink. They tell you the ghost story of that bar, and then you move on to the next one and do the same thing. So even though I don't drink, I still think that that would be a fun thing to do. Um, I could possibly just drink some water or maybe a non-alcoholic beverage of choice. But I still think that that would be an awesome trip to go pub crawling through haunted bars. What do you think? Yeah, I just... Uh... Really more concerned about the fact of how long the uh, tour guide will take me because I don't drink either. So I'd probably be as sober as sin by the time the tour's over with. That's okay. We could probably be a designated driver, make some new friends. Right. So we do have a story that uh, basically takes place not in New Orleans per se, but it is uh, how you say... Uh, uh, sim not a uh, synopsis. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, symbiotic. Uh, yeah, synopsis. Uh, no. Usually, uh, the word I'm looking for is the one that's uh, basically you know, even though it doesn't happen in New Orleans proper, it's always been. Include it whenever you talk about New Orleans. And that's Myrtle's Plantation. Would you please tell us about it? Okay. 
let's see, because I thought we were going to go first with Maria Lebeau, but I can start with Myrtles. Okay, let me see. Bring up my notes here. Okay, Nurtle, Nurtle, Myrtles Plantation. It is 98 miles northwest of New Orleans if you take the interstate roads. However, being so close, a lot of people, when you think of New Orleans, you think of Louisiana, you think of hauntings, this is one of the most famous places that come to mind. This was a historic home and former plantation located actually in St. Francisville, as I mentioned, 98 miles north of New Orleans. And it was built in 1796 by General David Bradford. And it is known as one of America's most haunted homes. One of the most famous hauntings at Myrtles is the haunting of Chloe. She was reported as being a slave owned by Clark and Sarah Woodruff, who were the owners of the plantation at the time. Now, the story varies here. Some say that she was a mistress of Clark's. Some say that she was his spy, so to speak, listening in at keyholes to learn his business dealings or other purposes. After being caught, it is said that either by Clark or Sarah, one of her ears was removed, and so she wore a green turban to hide this. Supposedly, she baked a cake she baked the cake because it was rumored that they were going to either send her away or to avoid punishment. So she baked this cake and inside she contained an extract of boiled and reduced oleander leaves, which are poisonous. Now, why did she bake the cake? Um, again, some say she was getting revenge on the woodruffs. Others say it was an attempt to redeem her position by curing the family of this poisoning. However, according to the legends, her plan did backfire. Only Sarah and her two daughters ate the cake and died of the poisoning. Now, the other slaves came and hung Chloe. Once she was passed, they threw her into the Mississippi River. Now, this was thought either to be a punishment for escaping that Clark set up and other reasons say that this was done because they didn't want something to happen to them. So in return, they got rid of her. Now, the interesting thing is there is no record of the Woodruffs ever owning a slave named Chloe or any slaves at all. Also, according to the legend, Sarah and her two daughters were poisoned, but the daughter, Mary Octavia, survived well into adulthood. And according to public records, Sarah, James, and Cornelia Woodruff were not killed either, but instead died of yellow fever. However, even though there's no factual accuracy of this story, some do believe that a woman wearing a green turban does haunt the plantation. There have been many photos taken of this, in fact, there's one famous photo that I will post on our website. And this photo is on the outside of the plantation on the porch. You can see an apparition which looks like a woman wearing a long gown of that time period and a turban on her head. So I'll go ahead and include that photo again on our website if y'all want to check that out. Some other legends that revolve around the house is that it's supposedly built on an Indian burial ground. And there's also a ghost of a young Native American woman that has been reported to be seen on the site. During the Civil War, the house was ransacked by Union soldiers, and legends claim that three were killed in the house. They say that there's a blood stain in the doorway, roughly about the size of a human body, that will not come clean. They've tried cleaning it, painting over it, However, it seems that it continues to appear. Also, cleaners have said that when they try to move the broom or the mop into that area, that there's some unseen force holding it back as to not allow them to get into that area to clean the floors near it. Now, going back with Chloe, supposedly when Sarah Woodruff and her... Question. Yes. 
have there actually been any invest, uh, actual investigations there at Plantation? Yes, there have, and I will um, talk about that at the end. Okay. Um, they have had investigations here. They also do ghost tours. So people have caught things with their cameras on ghost tours. Um, also, it is still open to the public as a bed and breakfast. So people have experienced things while staying at the bed and breakfast. Going back to the Chloe story, it was a custom to cover mirrors after a death. This is in many customs. However, legend has it that one of the Mirrors was not covered after the deaths of Sarah and her children. Supposedly, this mirror has trapped Sarah and her children, and you can occasionally see handprints on it, as well as there's been theory of seeing faces. I'll see if I can find a picture of the mirror as well to post. To me, it looks like it's just where mirrors grow old and they start to lose their reflection and kind of gray or brown out. But if I can find that, I'll post that. You can have your own thoughts and opinions on it. It is also reported to be haunted by a young girl that died in 1868. This girl was supposedly treated by a local voodoo practitioner. However, she still died. And it has been reported that she supposedly appears in the room where she died. People have awakened with reports of having voodoo practiced on them while sleeping in the room. There is also reports of ghosts who walks and staggers or even crawls up the stairs and stops at the 17th step. Some say that this is William Drew Winter, a previous owner of the home, who was murdered at the house. He was actually shot on the front porch, but according to legend, he staggered or crawled up the stairs and collapsed dead on the 17th step. Others say that he collapsed into his wife's arms at this step. However, the story has been contested that he actually died in his wife's arms. A little bit of pop culture. You had asked about ghost hunting. There has been several paranormal investigations done in this home. One of the most famous was featured on Ghost Hunters back in 2005. And what did they find out? They did get some evidence. Um, if I remember correctly, a couple of them did stay in one of the rooms and had a few things move. If I remember correctly, one of the lights in the lamp flickered. Again, if I'm incorrect, let me know on that. On the outside, they did capture an image using a thermal camera that detects heat. It was an image of a man, so it could possibly be the ghost of William Drew Winter that they had caught. Also in 2001, Unsolved Mysteries filmed a segment about the hauntings at the plantation, and according to the host, Robert Stack, the production crew did experience technical difficulties during the production of the segment. Do you have any other questions for me on that? Now you said uh, is that uh, bed breakfast, is that open still today? It is. And do they allow uh, nightly ghost hunting tours on the location or have they, you know? It is still open for people to stay. As I said, they do do ghost tours. Um, let me check about any paranormal investigations. Yes, I do show it is still open for you to go stay in. And as I said, they do daily tours there. As far as paranormal investigations, I think you would need to contact the current owner or caretaker to inquire about doing investigations there. Because since it is a hotel that is open to the public, I think that you would need to make arrangements with them in order to do that. I hope our fans have actually got some uh, questions on this as well. If you do have any questions, you'd be more than happy to contact us at theskepticpsychic.com. Yes, you can email us at info at skepticpsychic.com, or you can also fill out a form at our website, skepticpsychic.com. Let us know if you have any questions or any comments on this story or any other story that we share on our shows. So, speaking of New Orleans and as I told the story about the voodoo priestess, 
I had seen a story on Facebook. Now I can't find it, but supposedly there was a voodoo priestess who was very well known in Louisiana. Ah, just found it. Her name was Julia Brown, and she told people in her neighborhood that one day she was going to die and take the whole town with her. She died in 1915, and when she did, a hurricane hit Louisiana and killed 300 people, wiping out her town. Now, it says the name of the the town or village was Frenier. All that's left of this area now is just a cemetery. And there is a story there that is linked from a Tumblr. And so I'll go ahead and include that link as well, so if anybody's interested in reading up more on Julia. Speaking of voodoo, voodoo, why don't you tell us about the most famous voodoo priestess? Voodoo. Not hoodoo, voodoo. There is a difference. Voodoo. Voodoo is, is more magic. Because we're going to talk about the babe. Which babe? The babe with the power. Which power? The power of voodoo. Hoodoo. You do. I'm going to talk about the babe. <laughs> okay. <gasps> Alrighty. The queen of New Orleans voodoo, Marie Laveau. She was born September 10th, 1801, to Charles Trudeau, a biracial man of color, and Marguerite Dercantel Marie Catherine Laveau, who was multiracial. So that would mean that Marie Laveau was a free woman whose ancestors can be dated back to Africa, Native American, and of French descent. Now, according to uh, the stories, her grandmother was born a slave and bought her way to her freedom. So that way, Marie's father would actually be a free man. I know a lot of people are going to be a little bit mad. But rumor has it that Marie herself did have at least seven slaves in her lifetime. After the death of uh, Marie's mother, Laveau, while went on the tutelage of a Dr. Jean Bayou, he was a well-known uh, Sen- Senegalese uh, conjurer. And with that help, she was able to uh, dominate the culture and society of the, uh, the voodoo religion there in New Orleans. Now. I would also like to stress the fact that Marie Laveau was a devout Catholic in her life. She actually married a a man by the name of Jacques Perry, who was a uh, free man of color, who had fled as a refugee from the Haitian Revolution in the former colony of Saint-Dominique. Jacques was part of a large white and Creole of color immigration of refugees to New Orleans in 1809 after the Haitian Revolution. Marie's only two children from uh, Jacques and her that survived in adulthood were her two daughters, Marie Eucharist Eloise Laveau and Marie Philomène Glapion. Her husband, a little bit uh, question about when he died. After Jacques died, she began a domestic partnership with a Christophe Dominique de Mani de Gapion, who was a nobleman of a French descent, whom she lived with until his death in 1855. Uh, according to the birth and baptismal records, they had seven children. In her full-time job, she had opened up a hairdressing salon to uh, make ends meet, that sort of thing. And it was mostly high society people that came there. They would come there to, uh, you know, get their hair done, their nails done, that sort of thing. They had any problems with marriage or love. Marie was very happy to help them using the ancient practices of voodoo to help them. A lot of the uh, rumors about her is she had a snake that she called a zombie, which was supposed to be an African god. But again, that was just basically one of the uh, wonderful rumors that do say. Now, she was a, a pillar of the community because she would actually go visit the prisoners uh, in the local jails who were sentenced to death. And a lot of times, with her influence, she would get these census commune 
if uh, came down to yes, you know, they were going to die, she was allowed to go on there and make their final meal for them, uh, say special prayers with them. She was mostly successful uh, on her efforts to uh, get the prisoners whom she favored pardons and commuted sentences, uh, so that way they can or on to her die. Now, during the decades as being the queen of voodoo and running her little beauty shop, she'd been asked several questions about family disputes, health, finances, and more, performing services in three main places, her home in St. Anne, Gull Square, and Lake Pontchartrain. She's been known as the third female leader of voodoo in New Orleans, the first being Santa de de de, who was a few years before been upsword by Marie Sandalope, and even herself, Marie Laveau, had rivals for her unique power. Sadly, she died. Everybody has to die. They buried her on the 15th of June, 1881, at the age of 79. Where is it that they buried her? She was buried at Salt Louis Cemetery Number 1, which I am going to post in the show notes about the address to it. Now, stories about her, that if you go to her little uh, tomb, uh, if you make an X, spin around three times, and call out your wish, if um, Madame Laveau feels it's worthy, she will grant your wish. And in order to uh, confirm that she granted your wish, you would go back to her tomb, circle your X, and leave an offering. However, interesting uh, these days because of the vandalism on her tomb. In fact, right before they closed it completely on 2015, somebody painted Marie Laveau's tomb completely pink vinyl, which really kind of ticked off the... uh... Pink vinyl? Yes, pink vinyl. Why would you paint it pink vinyl? No one knows uh, what's going on, so they officially have closed down, as of 2015, the St. Louis Cemetery Number 1, as well as Number 2. It's only open to uh, families who have actual graves there, as well as tours. You can't just go into the area anymore. It's very strongly discouraged right after somebody painted it completely pink vinyl took a lot of money to go in there and uh, clean it up and make it uh, presentable again. But you can still see the X's and the circles uh, on Marie's tomb. That's really sad that people would do that. I just, I can't understand why people have to go and ruin things for other people. How they can be so disrespectful of the town, of Miss LeBeau. What goes on in people's minds these days? That's my question. Oh yeah, it's just very, very sad the fact that not only are, were you desecrating somebody's uh, oh, let's take out the fact that Marie Laveau is well known and popular. Who cares if uh, she's, you know, the patron saintess of the voodoo practices? This is somebody's memorial to their family members and for uh, somebody to go in and, I mean, if I'm just using an example. Let's say Bob Johnson dies. Now, Bob Johnson is a complete nobody. If you are Bob Johnson out there, I'm sorry, this is just an example. But five, ten years later, someone comes around and goes, oh, look, I'm going to destroy Bob Johnson's headstone and dig a bunch of dirt from him. Why would you desecrate the memory, the honor, the glory of Bob Johnson? He was a nobody to you, but he may have been somebody to, say, Phil Johnson, his great-grandson, who he uh, helped raise. To me, I don't feel that desecration of any type of tomb, grave marker, dirt, that sort of thing, should not be uh, desecrated in any way, shape, or form. That is my uh, take on Marie Laveau, she may have been a a voodoo priestess, devout Catholic, community go-getter, and well-loved and beloved. 
I also want to talk about a little bit of the history of the wonderful city of New Orleans. Basically, I know a lot of people out there believe that uh, vampires have pretty much roamed the uh, New Orleans. In fact, in the 2015 poll, they have said that out of the many people there in New Orleans, they say there are about 50 actual practicing vampires. Now, New Orleans has actually a history with uh, vampirism. One of the most legendary stories is about the uh, Cassette Maidens. And 10 years after the uh, foundation of the town, let's just call it 1728, is when King Louis XV sent a group of chaste women in care of the Ursuline priests who were instructed to marry the women to the settlers as hurry as possible. In an attempt to stop the French colonists from finding native wives. Now, some say these quote unquote chaste women may have been from the uh, questionable size. Either they were prostitutes, prisoners, women of questionable means. But then, of course, the official word was they were chaste women. Now, when they arrived, in the town of New Orleans uh, to be picked up by the Sisters of the Ursuline Nuns from Rouen, France. Their mission was to educate the women of the colony and evangelize the natives. When these women arrived to be taken care of, they were sickly. They were pale. They had just gone on a, what should have been a three-month voyage, but it turned out to be five. Many of them may have had the early signs of tuberculosis. They may have had the signs of yellow fever appearing to the onlookers, they seemed to be almost more dead than alive. They were carrying what the natives called cassettes or caskets, which basically uh, held a change of clothes. There uh, a few uh, items that they brought from France over to here, and they looked so much like caskets. So they were given the uh, name of the Cassette Girls. They were promptly picked up and taken to the uh, Ursuline uh, Mission there in New Orleans, a uh, pretty much nunnery area. Now, legends has it that they may have been vampires coming over, female vampires, because during that time that they arrived, mysterious deaths happened. Draining of blood, uh, deaths real quickly, that sort of thing. Looking at a, at a skeptic principle, we're talking about this was during the Yellow Death. We're looking at the time of cholera. We're looking at the time of tuberculosis really being very familiar in, uh, in the situation. Now, also legend says that the women were never married. However, in New Orleans, every first families, they love toting the fact that their mama was one of the cassette girls as being one of the first women that were brought over by King Louis. In 1978, a group of paranormal researchers went out to the old nunnery where the women were kept. Rumor has it they had a window boarded up to keep the women inside. They uh, snuck over the wall with camera and other equipment, and that was the last time anybody saw them alive. The next morning, the researchers were found dead at the bottom of the window, drained of their blood. Or so the story is so. I prefer, basically, these wonderful uh, cassette women were the uh, first French brides for the French men that were just coming over. Now, I've heard stories about people still to this day being encountered by strange and entrancing people, that they'll be at the French Quarter in one of the bars uh, having a drink or out walking the streets, and they'll see these gorgeous people who seem to entrance them. These people try to lead them into a dark alley. Well... Let me tell you about the most entrancing person. Might have been, might have been not a vampire, but he was by the name of Jacques Saint Germain. He was a nobleman in the uh, early part of the 19th century. He was well claimed to be, for his knowledge, 
charming wit and seemingly ages, ageless presence. He spoke of events that happened 100 years ago in the past with great detail. He threw lavish parties, food, entertainment, and most prestigious guests, but yet never ate a bite of himself. He mostly just took a sip of wine from a special bottle that he had. Not long after taking up residence in New Orleans, things got really creepy quickly. One night... Monsieur Jacques had a lady over to his home. He invited her to a party with many up-and-coming elites in New Orleans. After a while, as gentlemen do, he took her to the balcony and then he attempted to bite her neck. She freaked out and was able to distract him long enough to take the only escape she had right off the balcony onto the uh, pavement below. The story says she had completely terrified and had blood trickling down her neck. People quickly surrounded her and had the police there in no time. When the police came to Jacques' house to make some sense in the incident, they found clothes from all different time periods stained with blood. No food, not even utensils in the house. There were many bottles of what seemed to be red wine, but in fact, were human blood upon further expansions. And of Jacques Saint-Germain, was it there? and never to return. And then, in 1932, a young girl stormed down Royal Street, physically panicked, her strides broken only the diligent interceptions of the police officer, began mumbling a story of a bit far-fetched. Two brothers had tied her up along with several other victims and held captives so uh, these two brothers could drink their blood. The two brothers were the Carter brothers, the girl claimed that she was only an escape due to her captor's carelessness in securing her ropes. Of course, police being skeptic, but still agreed to uh, take her back to the home on the corner of Royal and St. Anne. When they arrived with the girl, they were hard to find, just as a woman described, four other victims, half dead, tied to one of the chairs. The two brothers, John and Wayne Carter, unaware the girl had escaped, went under routines as usual. When they returned in the evening, they were quickly apprehended, and upon their capture confessed, immediately begging to be murdered, for they claimed they were vampires. They were tried, found guilty, and executed. After that, John and Wayne Carter were never seen again, alive or dead, in the town of New Orleans. Now. Again, there are about 50 vampires living in New Orleans, according to a 2015 poll. They actually have an organization there in New Orleans, uh, charitable organizations, which basically they feed the homeless. And let me get their name for you real quick. They are called New Orleans Vampire Association, and they do holiday charity events. They make food for the uh, homeless, as well as a, a lot of good things. They do accept donors for uh, financial compensation and sometimes even sexual favors. They observe them for some time, and only if they're fairly certain they're the kind of people that won't freak out, they ask them to become a donor. So it's kind of a uh, mutual consent type situation. Though the habits of modern vampires seem frightening to most, they are known as being incredibly friendly. And their ages range in between from 18 years to 50. So any other questions about them? Now, do you believe in actual vampires? Um, I'm not talking about the organization that you're discussing or people who drink blood of willing donors. But do you believe in the whole mythological supernatural demonic everlasting immortal vampires who feed on blood based on uh as i have stated that the vampire myth and legend have pretty much come from sicknesses like cholera tuberculosis that sort of thing back in the day as for somebody doing it willingly i think that's basically has come down to being the modern day take of vampires now, what I find intriguing is the fact that 
there are legends of vampires in every country on every continent of the world. It's not just in New Orleans or in Eastern Europe. It's throughout the world there have been sightings. China, Africa. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? You also got to understand that there's also been sicknesses on that as well. We've had cholera, we've had yellow fever, we've had tuberculosis, we've had so many sicknesses, whether it's Buddhist, Christianity, Muslim, religious things saying that if Bob, I like using Bob, Bob's such a nice person. One of these says you got to meet Bob. This is just for example, not saying there's a Bob Johnson out there that is this, but up until the 20th century, even into the 21st, myths, legends, and stories about creatures rising from the grave. Because not only do vampires rise from the grave, there's also belief that werewolves rise from the grave. Zombies rise from the grave. Modern study has shown that, yes, it takes a while for the body to decompose. Yes, that people may have a sleeping sickness. Yes, when you have tuberculosis and you're coughing up blood, that does not mean that someone's been sucking you dry. This is very true. So what you're saying is you don't believe that there's actual vampires. You think it is unfortunate souls who suffered from illness that were misinterpreted? Misinterpreted, misdiagnosed uh, type of situations. However, modern day vampirism is true. There are people out there who are drinking blood and calling themselves vampires. But they're not the supernatural, immortal beings that we think of when we think of vampires. They're actual people who just enjoy drinking blood. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. We can always uh, look back at the dark history at New Orleans by uh, taking a look at a uh, prolific, uh, I would say, female socio, uh, socialite and an notorious whispered enslaver. And her little house called La Lori Mansion. Can you tell me about that, Kim? La Lori Mansion. Now, in pop culture, we know it as the house in the third season of American Horror Story, where Kathy Bates portrayed Madame Delphine La Lori. Also, if you are a fan of Portals to Hell with Jack Osborne and Katrina Weidman, shout out to them. They did do an investigation of this house on Portals to Hell. Then it also came out on Famously Afraid, which is a show where celebrities tell their ghost stories. If you've ever seen the show Dance Moms, you know Christy and Chloe Luca Siak. Apologize if I, impro- if I pronounce that incorrectly. The Cossack. Thank you. They tell a story of when they were on a tour a ghost tour outside of, I'm sorry, they tell a story when they went on a ghost tour through New Orleans. As they came to the LaLaurie Mansion, they they didn't go in on this particular tour, but they did stand outside and hear the story. They took a picture of the mansion entrance, which left them extremely horrified. Um, I highly recommend checking out that episode to hear more about that. It's very, very chilling. Just be careful what you photograph people. <laughs> also, Nicolas Cage owned La Lori Mansion between 2007 and 2009. He says he bought the house in 2007 and figured it would be a good place for him to write the great American horror novel. This he mentioned in Vanity Fair in 2014. Unfortunately, in 2009, he lost the house to foreclosure. Also. In breaking news, this is as recent as this year, creators of the Conjuring series have confirmed that they're going to be starting a new horror series based on the Lori Mansion. Now, who was Madame LaLaurie and what is the deal with her mansion? Madame Delphine McCarthy LaLaurie was a wealthy New Orleans socialite and a notorious enslaver. 
1832, she moved into the mansion, which is at the intersection of today's Royal and Governor Nichols Streets. And this was with her third husband, Dr. Leonard Louis Nicholas Lalori. And throughout the years, information surfaced about her mistreatment of her servants. According to historian Carolyn Merrill Long, Madame Lalori was first investigated in 1828 for cruelty towards enslaved people, though nobody's been able to find these records of this investigation. However, there is documentation that Lalori did pay for legal services and sold a number of enslaved people following this so called investigation. Also, one of Lalori's neighbors saw one of her slaves, a girl who was about eight years old, fall to her death from the roof of the Royal Street Mansion while trying to avoid punishment. The body was subsequently buried on the mansion grounds. Jean de Levine, in her 1945 account, said that the girl's age was actually 12 and gave her the name Leah. Later, other writers elaborated on the case, saying that she had been brushing Delphine's hair when she hit a snag, causing Lorraine to grab a whip and chase her. This incident did lead to an investigation of the LaLoris, and they were found guilty of illegal cruelty and forced to forfeit nine of their slaves. However, these slaves were bought back by the LaLoris through a relative, and they returned to the Royal Street residence. Also, there were stories of LaLori keeping her cook chained to the kitchen stove, and she would beat her daughters if they attempted to feed the slaves. On April 10th of 1834, a fire broke out in the LaLori residence on Royal Street, and this started in the kitchen. When the police and fire marshals got there, they did find the cook, who was a 70-year-old woman, and she was chained to the stove by her ankle. She later said that she had set the fire herself as an attempt of suicide because she feared being punished. She said that slaves were taken to the utmost rooms and never returned. Bystanders responding to the fires attempted to enter the slave quarters to ensure that everybody had been evacuated. When the Lalories refused them the keys, the bystanders broke down the doors to the slave quarters and they found seven slaves who had been horribly mutilated. When the discovery of the abused slaves became widely known, a mob of local citizens attacked the Lalori residence and demolished and destroyed everything upon which they could lay their hands on. A sheriff and his officers were dispersed on the crowd, but by the time the mob left, the property had sustained so much damage, there was scarcely anything remaining but the walls. So therefore, the original mansion occupied did not survive and is no longer there. The mansion that is there now at 1140 Royal Street, that is now known as the Lori Mansion, was rebuilt. So it is not the one that was inhabited by the Lorries. However, just because a building's gone doesn't mean that the souls move on. For almost 200 years, there have been reports of paranormal activity coming from the new home. There is a room in the mansion where the slaves were often kept and there are reports of moans coming from this room. Also phantom footsteps echoing throughout the house can be regularly heard. There are other tales of wails of agony that plague the rooms at night. You hear doors slam, the faucet suddenly turn on, and the furniture moves on its own. On the bed you can see imprints of bodies as if somebody's laying there even though nobody has slept on them. And there have been apparitions of slaves, some even wearing chains, seen walking around the property. Many who have stood near the house have reported a feeling as if they were taken over by negative energy. Now, going back to the picture that was taken by Christy and Chloe, they did feel this energy. And as I said, that energy carried over when they left the property through that picture on the phone. I highly recommend checking that episode out. In 1894, there was a tenant who lived at the mansion. At this time, the house had been converted into apartments, and he was brutally murdered in his room. They found his home had been ransacked as if somebody had gone through everything, and the police assumed that he was a victim of robbery. However, an interesting account regarding this murder deals with police interviewing neighbors about the disappearance. 
One of his friends claimed that he was having problems with sprites in the home. He claimed that his friend told him that there was a demon in the house who wasn't going to rest until he had met his end. So my question is, was his life taken by some criminal who broke in in the middle of the night? Was it a spirit of a slave seeking revenge for what had happened to them? Could it have been something created from this negative energy that arose from what happened in this home? Nobody really knows. What are your thoughts? Hmm. It might be uh, something that just uh, like maybe tape running through a historical. I really don't believe something might still be there. Well, on the Portals to Hell episode, they did catch some compelling evidence in the helm. Using a sort of ghost box, they were able to catch voices of what they thought were the slaves in the slave quarters. Also in the room, I think it was the parlor, they did catch on camera a kind of a figure. It wasn't an actual figure, but they were using some kind of device that does like body mapping and it maps out points. It seemed that this camera. I remember seeing that episode. It's like a little six to eight inch thing that kind of moves around and sits on a couch or. Yes, they do believe that this was the ghost of Leah, the young girl who fell from the balcony and died. To me, I think there is something there that is more than just residual. Like I said, if you've seen the Famously Afraid episode, it does also hint to something more than a residual. Something definitely sinister that is there as well. So I definitely think, yes, there might be some residual because of the energy so strong there. But I also believe that there is something else that's more intelligent that's still there. So that's my story of LaLaurie. If anybody has anything that they'd like to share, if they've been to LaLaurie and have any experiences, or if you've seen it on any other ghost shows or anything like that, and you want to share what you saw on there, if there was any evidence caught, let us know. You can email us at info at skepticpsychic.com or you can also fill out our form at skepticpsychic.com on our contact page and let us know your thoughts on this story as well as any of the others that you've heard tonight. Um, do you have any other thoughts or comments? Well, I would like to say, you know, if you've got some other stories you'd like for us to discuss about the wonderful town of New Orleans. This is just a wonderful walk down information about things that really uh, fascinates us. Drop a line at theskepticpsychics.com. We are also on, uh, is it Apple Podcast? We are on Apple Podcast. Leave us a five-star review there. Again, stressing the fact, five-star. And let us, you know, know what you, know what you think. Well, you can leave us any no, no, no. Five star, five star, five star. <laughs> we prefer five star, but definitely let us know how we're actually doing. Um, please, if you do rate us either on Apple Podcasts or even our Facebook page, Skeptic Psychic, not only rate us, but let us know how we're doing. Leave a review for us. That way we know what we need to fix or what we're doing good at, what you like about us. Who would you like to recommend this week? Dark journalists, it does take a penetrating look into the rise of the deep state and breakaway civilizations with in-depth, cutting-edge interviews, documentaries. Basically, he runs into UFO, covert ops, uh, advanced technology, more. The host is by the name of Daniel Liss, and he has uh, guests, including best-selling author Graham Cook, former defense minister of Canada Paul Hellier, uh, Linda Bolton Howe, uh, Joseph P. Farrell, and he's actually uh, had conspiracy expert Jude Mars on the show. So if you're looking for something that uh, is kind of like conspiratorial uh, slash informative, check out The Dark Journalist. Go ahead and send me the link for that, and I will post it in our description. I would like to recommend a show I just found over the weekend. Um, this is on 
YouTube, and it's called The Paranormal Files. This is a guy. Let me see if I can find his name. Is his name Jim Moore? Mm, I don't think so. Colin. Okay. Colin Broen is his name. And this is a web series that explores all things paranormal. Um, they go and do paranormal investigations on the show. Um, I really liked this one. It wasn't like the ghost adventures where they're like in your face and being disrespectful to the spirits. It was very, in my opinion, very well done. The show is done bi-weekly. They do go across the world, traveling state to state or even country to country to do these investigations. Um, so I highly recommend it. Again, it's called Paranormal Files, and I will also link that in the description as well. All right. Well, I think that's about the thoughts of everything. Uh, we do love you. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. I do have a review that I would like to read. Mm, let me guess. Lucy Zimmerman. Yes. Yes. Lucy. Um, she posted on our Facebook page. It says, loving what you guys do. I listen to the podcast while doing chores. And I'm always entertained by personal stories you two share. And love learning the history behind the topics you cover. For any fans of the supernatural and all things that go bump in the night, make sure to give this podcast a try. Thank you, Lucy. Um, really appreciate that. And we appreciate you listening each week. Yes. Again, if anybody else wants to leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it. And we will read it on the air. Yes, we will read it on the air. If you'd like to remain anonymous, just let us know. And as always, thank you for listening. Have a great night and pleasant dreams. And pleasant nightmares, too. Have a good one. Good night. Yes. Good night, everybody. <laughs>